July 20th, 1985, the day that Mel Fisher and his treasure salvers divers found the main pile of the Nuestra Señora de Atocha. Hi, I'm KT Bud Jones. On the left-hand side of this picture in the mask shirt. I'm Sid Jones, and I'm on the right side of the picture. We're going to tell you a little bit more about the Atocha main pile using pictures from our personal archive taken during the course of the find and shortly thereafter. So, set the stage. We had been working down a trail of artifacts that had been going on for miles and miles. The problem was is that it was a really hard trail to follow. We'd only been finding a few little things here and there, but not much along the way. All of a sudden though, the trail started to thicken with more artifacts and we knew we were getting close. The boats had been hopscotching down this imaginary line that we had projected out. And all of a sudden it looked like things were going to get better. The Dauntless, which is the boat that you see in the middle of this picture, had two divers down and they were excavating. The Swordfish briefly was on the left side of the, uh, the Dauntless, working just to the north. And then we transitioned to the south side, uh, just beyond their excavation. There were two Dauntless divers down that day, Andy Matrosi and Greg Wareham. And both Greg and Andy were working in a hole that was filled with ballast, pottery shards, and uh, barrel hoops, as well as coins. They knew they were getting close, but Greg took the opportunity to swim out the hole. He thought something might be just beyond the realm of the excavation. So as he swam to the south, he found an area that looked vaguely familiar. It looked to him like big loaves of bread on the seafloor, silver bars, and he waved his detector over the top of them. Sure enough, the detector went off and he, that confirmed that they were in fact metal. He came back, grabbed Andy, and Andy and he swam back to look at them, and then they surfaced right next to the swordfish's dive ladder. This picture was taken just after they had come up, and Andy and Greg are uh, there telling the swordfish crew about what they saw on the bottom. You won't see me in the picture because I've already jumped over the side. I'm one of the few swordfish divers that had any time left to dive that day. So when this picture was taken, I was on my way down to the bottom. So, Katie, why don't you take it from here? Well, of course, we all wanted to get in the, in, the, in the bottom, go down and see everything that was there. We've been waiting a long time to see the main pile of the Atocha, and we all jumped in. None of us had any bottom time left. We were all saturated, but it didn't matter. We all got our dive gear on and jumped in. J.J. Betancourt and I, another diver from the Swordfish, saw a silver bar sort of laying off on its own, away from the big mound of silver bars, and said, we're going to bring this one up. As we squatted over the top of it, trying to pick it up, it's an 80 pound bar of solid silver. We're not getting anywhere. We're not able to get to the surface. We're not even able to get off the bottom. Greg Wareham comes over and helps us by dropping our weight belts for us. And we start to inflate our BCs and kick like Mel and mad to get up to the surface and try to take the silver bar all the way up 60 feet to the, to the surface. Now, as we surface, we're away from the dive ladder. We don't know how to get back to the boat. We're struggling, and we, we, there were, we don't know. We can't drop the silver bar because everybody we know is underneath us. We can't go back down and put it on the bottom because we have no air left. So somehow we got to struggle our way over to the boat and get up the dive ladder with this 80-pound silver bar. Eventually, we do so as many others did that day, excited about finally finding what we've been looking for for 16 years. Silver bars, silver coins, etc. were laying everywhere. It was a reef of silver bars, 40 feet long, 20 feet wide, five feet high of solid silver. But once all of the chaos and the confusion and excitement settled down, we realized what we had to do. We had to preserve this information, this history, for all of time, and not just grab and go, but document what we're finding. As you can see here, there's a silver coin in Sid's hand and a silver bar right there, that bread loaf, as well as some silver coins and little bits of, uh, looks like pottery shards attached to that silver bar and lots of silver coins behind it. So when we started to actually get into looking at what was there, we did some fine scale excavation and we were amazed that we found 
intact coin chest right near the surface. Now, we've all heard of treasure chests and these were in fact real treasure chests. They didn't have locks and keys and hinges, they were just nailed together. But inside each one of these chests was 175 pounds of silver coins and the boxes were still preserved. We found 18 still intact, even though others had been damaged in the wreck. And over the course of the centuries, we did find 18 chests still intact. So uh, here you can see one just to the left and another one to the right. Portions of the boards that uh, covered the coins on the right chest were gone, uh, displaced, but you can see the, the coins inside. Here's a great shot on the bottom using uh, artificial light. You can see the color of the wood still apparent and the, the, the blackened silver sulfide coated coins in the middle. This was an amazing treasure trove, not only of treasure itself, but of history as well. So things started to really get organized as we began measuring, tagging, and photographing the individual artifacts. Katie, why don't you tell them what we're doing here? Well, we had to make sure that every artifact was drawn and photographed and recorded in situ or the way we, it was found. And you can see here, we're removing a coin chest. You can see the coins are all clumped under Sid's hand on the left. I'm in the middle, another diver on the right. And we're trying to remove it from the uh, cultural deposit that's below it. All of these artifacts were fused together, so it was very important to be careful how we remove them. And you can see one of the artifact tags down near the bottom of the picture, a yellow tag, already uh, readily tagged and ready to be brought to the surface. Now we're measuring everything in situ. Here we're measuring how big this coin chest was. There's several thousand coins inch in each one of these chests and they're in amongst the silver bars. On the top of the main pile, uh, the artifacts were sort of strewn, but once we removed the very top of them, they were stacked just like they had been almost 400 years ago. And we're measuring these to make sure we have all the data. Here, Bill Reichart on the right-hand side is, is writing down all the measurements that I am accumulating. And we're airlifting. Now, the airlifts weren't used to um, actually move artifacts, but just the dust to get the overburden off it so we could expose the artifacts, take the measurements, get them ready for removal and stabilization once we brought them on board and hopefully back to the, the labs in Key West. These are some of the timbers, the actual structural members of the Atocha that had survived all of these years underwater uh, the bacteria, the warm water, the teredo worms, because they were hidden they, underneath 47 tons of silver. Doing some more archaeology here, um, trying to draw and measure everything as we find it. Sid's on the left, myself in the middle, another diver on the right. All of these artifacts accumulated and congealed together, trying to decide which ones go with what and marking them so we can decide and decipher them once we get to the surface. It was an absolute labyrinth of uh, components that were all tumbled together. And so it was very difficult to take this apart. We kind of had to take it apart like taking apart a jigsaw puzzle rather than assembling it. So here you can see uh, the ballast stone that was there. There were over 200 tons of ballast stone associated with the lower hull structure of the ship. We've got created kind of a vertical wall as we're excavating into it. And amongst all that ballast stone are, of course, fragile artifacts, hull structure, and uh, other components of the ship. Even rope we found uh, in amongst these uh, items. So it was a very slow process to be able to pro to be able to uh, excavate through this uh, area. People think that we were just rape and pillage treasure hunters, but actually we did a great deal of archaeology because it behooved us to do so. It added to the value of what we were finding. It added to the value of the history that we were going to be preserving, and it we actually developed maritime archaeological skills that hadn't been used before, knowing how to do what people do on land underwater. And those skills we ended up teaching other people through the years. So initially, when we found the main pile, we were kind of unexpected or not expecting to find such a mass of uh, material in one area. And the only way that we had to bring the material to the surface, we had a couple of uh, milk carton crates 
and even an old shopping cart basket that were initially used. But very quickly, uh, the operations manager had these more formalized baskets fabricated in Key West overnight, and then they shipped them out to us so we could use these to, to recover the heavy items like this coin chest being brought to the surface. You can see it's padded with foam. Uh, the wood has been removed to uh, keep it from being damaged during movement of the heavy chest. So this is being brought to the surface. All these artifacts are then brought on deck. Some have to be kept wet, like the wood from the coin chest has been removed because we didn't want to damage it. And it's in those black bags in the back, trying to keep it moist. And you can see the coin chest and smaller silver bars laid out on the deck there, uh, waiting to go back into Key West. The problem was when you're finding 47 tons of treasure, how to bring it back. You're going to make the ship unstable if you aren't careful where you're putting all of this heavy, all of these heavy artifacts. And so we had to lay them about the ship so that we didn't lose our stability. Some down and below, some in our bunks, some along the edge of the gunnel, and not all of it at one time could be brought back because there was so much heavy treasure. Some of the coins weren't all in coin chests. Some were all broken apart. And you can see here, these little blackened Oreo cookies are actually pieces of eight. Um, and four, eight reals, two reals, etc., all in a bag. Tom Ford, captain of the swordfish at the time, is looking at some of these uh, coins. And as we broke off a little bit of the encrustation, they were like the day they were made. This is a very rare, actually old coin at that time, probably 50 years older than the Atocha itself. And it looks like the day it was made, and it was made by hand in Potosi and Lima, Peru. Now all of the artifacts that were being processed underwater, all that data had to come up and be made into charts. So we understood what part of the wreck we were working on, how the artifacts associated with each other. So it was my task to take all the data that was being generated on the bottom and transform it into working charts. Uh, and they were done in layers because of course their artifact strata uh, was in different layers. We made charts showing uh, artifacts in each layer uh, that would show the, the layered effect, how the artifacts related vertically as well as horizontally to each other. So that was a lot of my job out at sea when I wasn't diving and doing recovery. All I was doing was mapping and taking that data that it was being recovered and turning it into charts. So the day that we found the main pile was kind of an unusual one. Here's a picture of all of us celebrating, but this actually wasn't until the next day Katie, why don't you tell them about the actual day that we found the chart, or the, the main pile? Well, it was very exciting that day. We were all on the bottom bringing things up and, and being very excited about finally finding the Tocha main pile after a 16 year search. But that night we all sat around very quietly, reflecting. Uh, it had been 10 years to the day since Mel's son, Dirk, and his wife, Angel, and Rick Gage uh, died when the north wind flipped over. And also, we thought, now we found it, we're all going to have to get real jobs. So it was a reflective time. But when Mel comes out to the site, it's party time. And he brought with him the enthusiasm and the, uh, that he felt for finally finding what it was he's been looking for for 16 years. And don't forget lots of news media. We had <coughs> lots of folks that came out with Mel. The word got out very, very quickly to the various news organizations about the big find. Uh, we on the boats were kind of lit an isolated existence. And so we didn't expect the torrent of people and publicity that we got out there. Interestingly, Jimmy Buffett happened to be out near where we were finding the Atocha. He was out using one of our old ships, the Arbutus, as a potential photo album cover. Uh, and he was taking pictures of it out there. Um, and he heard over the, the radio on the boat that he was on that we had found the main pile and that Mel was out there. And so he came over and kind of joined the party. And so here you see Mel and Jimmy. Jimmy's playing Margaritaville, as you would guess. And Mel's sitting on his bench of silver bars that we made for them. And we're kind of listening to Jimmy's concert. You can see KT in the foreground. But Mel kind of has a kind of a pensive look. Maybe he's reflecting on the great cost to himself and his family uh, over the 16 year search. Uh, and 
and uh, he's a little bit reflective looking while uh, all this is going on. So when we came in to uh, port after that first week, uh, we were stunned by the number of people that we encountered, not only at the docks, but around the museum. Here I am standing in the back of one of our pickup trucks that's loaded with silver bars in the back. And uh, all these folks had gathered to watch the unloading process as we started taking some of the artifacts uh, into the museum. We had no clue how much publicity had actually gone out about this. And for the next uh, months, we were deluged by uh, media folks coming out, visiting the site, taking pictures, and we were doing lots of interviews. And ultimately, National Geographic came out and uh, shot a special about it. So. It was a pretty special event. Katie, do you have anything to add? Well, that we are eternally grateful to Mel Fisher and the Fisher family for letting us be part of this amazing adventure. We parted treasure salvers for almost two decades, and it was a, certainly a highlight of our lives of being part of this great expedition. Not only part of their family, but the fact that Sid and I could share this together and have endless stories to tell our friends and each other from that time period. Uh, if you'd like to hear more of these stories, please like and share our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it, and there'll be more of these stories coming. We have lots of pictures, lots of stories, lots of as it happened moments. And also a couple of books, Sid's book, um, uh, Sweat of the Sun, Tears of the Moon, uh, Tocha Treasure Adventure, and my book, Coins of the Lost Galleons will help fill in some of those stories as well. So we look forward to sharing more of this history with you. Hope you enjoyed this uh, anniversary podcast.